God's really like. This is what God is really like. All right, let's start off here. Abraham in the crucible. Abraham in the crucible. I'm on page 39. I hope that you read that chapter, refreshed your memory on Genesis chapter 22. And it says, why did God ask Abraham to offer this sacrifice? If God knows everything, what was the point? What was the point? And the story, of course, in Genesis 22 is asking him to sacrifice his son. And when you look at this, the whole idea, as you read in that first paragraph, it says, can you imagine how Abraham must have felt it was a totally revolting idea that a holy God should request that he sacrifice his own son, even if Abraham thought that this was acceptable. What about God's uh, promises of an inheritance? Without his son, the promise would be gone. The promise would be gone without uh, an inheritance. And when you look at this and think about this, um, what a story, you know, to ask him to sacrifice his one and only son, Dennis. You know, I believe Abraham wrestled with this, Jesse. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think he was holding on to the promise that you were just talking about, how God had promised through his seed he would make a great nation. But I think God wanted Abraham to see what that sacrifice was going to be because he was going to sacrifice his own son to a dying world. Yeah, yeah, very true, very true, very true. Now, I want you to think about this, and if you can't give me a response right now, I want you to give me one in, in a few minutes. Down at the bottom there of page 39, it says, How do you know the voice of God? How do you know when God is talking to you? And what are the ways that he communicates his will to you? How do you know the voice of God? Think about that. I'll come back to that in just a little bit. So if you want to share, share with us. Um, in the companion book here, <clears throat> on page 34, those of you that have the companion book, uh, L and G White Notes, it says, what is temptation? It is the means by which those who claim to be the children of God are tested and tried. Notice this, what it says. The means by which those who claim to be the children of God. If someone's not claiming to be the children of God, would there be any temptation? No, they're just kind of living, living their life out there fancy free. We read that God tempted Abraham and that he tempted the children of Israel. This means that he permitted circumstances to occur to test their faith and lead them back to him for health. Things happen. Things happen there to lead them back. It goes on. It says, give back to God your entrusted possession and more will be entrusted to you. Keep your possessions to yourself and you will receive no reward in this life and you will lose the reward of the life to come. It goes on to say, the last paragraph there on page 34, all the agony that Abraham endured during that dark and fearful trial was for the purpose of deeply impressing upon his understanding the plan of redemption for fallen man. On the next page, on page 35, it goes on to say, the connection with kindred and friends and the former habits and associations too often have so great an influence upon God's servants that he can give them but little instruction, can communicate to them but little knowledge of his purposes, and often after a time he sets them aside and calls others in their place whom he proves and tests in the same manner. The Lord would do much more for his servants if they were holy, that's W, holy, consecrated to him, 
esteeming his service above the ties of kindred and all other earthly associations. You ever know somebody that got into that position? In relationship to not giving full of their life, esteeming his service above the, the ties of kindred to men? Anybody want to respond about how do you know the voice of God? Sure. Okay. <laughs> so I think it comes with, I don't want to say practice, and yet it is more experience. Mm -hmm. You know, the more that you interact with God, the more you come to hear his voice and feel, for me, it's there's a peace you know, that you have when you know you're talking with God and when you know you're responding to God. Even though everything around you is going crazy, even though what you're about to do is something maybe you don't want to do, but you've prayed about it, you've heard God, God's voice, now you have peace. And I think you, you start to learn and train yourself to hear God's voice in that way. So when this test came to Abraham, this wasn't the first time he'd heard God's voice, right? He had been right. hearing God's voice. Right. Not just hearing God's voice, he had been responding to God's voice and following. And that's the same for us. You know, in Revelation, what does it say? Um, uh, they follow the lamb wherever he goes. Uh -huh. And that's what Abraham did. And that's, that's where we have to come in our relationship with God. And when we do that, every day, every moment, every second, we begin to hear his voice more clearly. Now, before you leave there, Peter, you know, there's a second part that says, how do you know the voice of God, which you've been referring to? Then it goes on to say, how do you know when God is talking to you? Yeah, well, I think I can tell you this. There have been moments, you know, somebody says something to you in passing even sometimes. And so it, it may be in prayer time, it may be in the Bible, but also sometimes somebody says something to you and it's like, when they say it, everything stops and it just hits you. And it, they're not even, often not even trying to say anything to you. They're just kind of casually saying it. But the Holy Spirit is there. Mm -hmm. And it's like, wait a minute, you need to hear that. And you need to apply it this way in your life. And you just like, Phew. so, I mean, um, I got lost in my thinking there about your question. But <laughs> this is how, to me, this is how God speaks to us. Mm -hmm. Not only by scripture, not only by prayer, but also as we interact with godly people around us. Anyone else? So we, we, may, we may hear a lot of people today pretending to hear the voice of God. And I think in, in uh, I think it's in Second Peter, one twenty. There is a very good uh, uh, clue that we can follow mm -hmm. to see if it's the word of God. Mm -hmm. and, and it says that any prophecy is a personal interpretation. So anything that we hear today, we have to compare to what is written in the Bible and in the express word of God. Because people may come from nowhere pretending that they have heard the word of God. And even though this that we are studying today, this example of Abraham, mm -hmm. it was something not conventional. It, it was something that God has pro prohibited to his people to do, to sacrifice their children. Right, so, right. Like, like, like Peter said, he must have been a very good uh, relation between Abraham and God that he understood that it was God that we, was telling him to sacrifice his, his son. Son, yeah. And that's true, what you just pointed out, Juan. That was a, a, a common thing uh, in that uh, time period of, of people sacrificing their kids. I mean, that... I, I never have been able to understand that. You know, can you imagine those of you that have children, you know, sacrificing your child because of your religious beliefs, quote unquote, and that, that was going on at that time period. It sure was. You know, when I think of this, how do you know the voice of God and how do you know when he's talking to you? I have to share with you um, what happened 
uh, to us many years ago. Um, there was a, an opportunity that came along for us to go into business for ourselves. And um, I was working for some other company at the time in long-term care. And um, this opportunity came along. And so we, uh, I thought anyways, we really prayed about it and, and we waited for the Lord to, to work and we saw what we thought was the Lord working uh, as far as down payment money and so forth and so on, which was very little. But then, you know, after a, a few weeks, a few months, um, I began to wonder, you know, is this really where I need to be? And um, there was a lot of things that happened. I won't go into a lot of details, but a lot of things that happened over the course of that four years and 11 months. And um, there were some good things. We, we had two children. We wouldn't have had them if we had never gone down that path, probably. And um, it also uh, brought me, you, you, you talk about a crucible. Um, that was a crucible. Um, I'd never faced religious prejudice in my life until being there in that business. I had never faced uh, discrimination because of where I came from in the geographical area of the United States, which I faced that during that period of time. Never had faced any of that. And then in the end, um, losing everything. And so, you know, you go back, and, and when I see this question, and I've seen it before, you know, you, you start asking yourself, well, uh, whose voice was I listening to? Was I listening to God, or was I trying to get what I wanted, which was to be able to work for myself and not have to work for somebody else? And I was willing to, to have blinders on, so to speak, to see it happen. Um, so... Don't know. I do know this, that uh, it changed my life after those four years and 11 months. I do know that. Changed my life in relationship to my relationship with Jesus Christ. Dennis? You know, Jess, uh, I think sometime or another in our walk with Christ and we've been tested we felt like God has forsaken us. Mm -hmm. I think there's everybody here today. Is, you're probably about to read this statement, so I'm going to go ahead and read it. It's okay. On page, it's on page 35. Okay. Many complain that Jesus seems a long ways off. Who has placed him a long ways off? Has it not been your own course of action that has separated you from Jesus? Has he not forsaken you, but you have forsaken him for other lovers? It is when you wander from his side and are charmed with the voice of the seducer and fasten your affections upon some trifling thing that you are in danger of losing your peace and trust and confidence in God. Then it is that Satan presents to you the thought that Jesus has forsaken you. But it is not that, but is it not that you have forsaken Jesus? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's very well put. And yes, I was going to be reading that in a little bit. That I had that underlined on page 35. It sure was. Um, anyone else want to share at this point about how do you know the voice of God? And how do you know when he's talking to you? All right, let's take a look at page 40. Wayward Israel. Notice it says Hosea chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And so that's what we're going to be reading now. And um, it says here that we've got Hosea 2, verses 2 and 3. Uh, Peter, would you read that? And Melissa, read the next one, 5 through 7, please. And uh, it's Daniel, right? Uh, Hosea 2, 8 and 9. And Rebecca, Hosea 2.10, please. 
And the question is, it says, what methods does God say he will use to pull Israel back to himself? And what would these experiences have felt like? What would these experiences have felt like? So we're going to start off with Peter, Hosea chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. Well, you called my name. I was trying to find Hosea. I felt like I was in like a Pathfinder competition. And That's right. Couldn't find it. That's not nervous. good. All right, Hosea chapter 12. What, what were the verses again? It's chapter 2. Oh, 2. Chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. See, I'm all discombobulated. Uh, Hosea chapter 2, uh, and say the verses again. 2 and 3. 2 and 3. Bring charges against your mother. Bring charges, for she is not my wife, for I nor am I her husband. Let her put away her harlotries from her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and expose her as in the day when she was born and make her like a wilderness and set her in a dry land and slay her with thirst. Can you imagine now the part of the question that says, what would these experiences have felt like? Strip her naked? Set her in the wilderness, like a, in a drought. I mean, just think about that, a drought. You know, I, we've gone through a drought here and out at my house for the last six weeks until the past week or so, and we got some water. I mean, it's dry, and it's hot. And then add to it a wilderness, what that would be like. Um, Melissa, five through seven, please. For their mother has played the harlot. She who conceived them has behaved shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me bread and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge, you, hedge up your way with thorns and wall her in so that she cannot find her path. She will chase her lovers but not overtake them. Yes, she will seek them but not find them. Then she will say, I will go and return to my first husband. For then it was better for me than now. Then it was better for me then. You know, to sum it up, they're going to take away everything that was given to her. It's all going to be gone. It's all gone. You know, when you think about, and it wasn't until... November 30th, 1990, that I understood some things. I lost everything. Everything on this earth that's materialistic. I lost it all. Everything was contrary to what I had been taught. I had been taught work hard and you'll succeed in life. That's the way it is out in the world. I had not been taught the other part. And I'm not blaming anybody. I don't, you know, blame anyone. I mean, I'm responsible for myself. But I lost everything. Didn't have a place to live. Had a hundred bucks. Four kids. Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? And I guess, folks, it's not in my case. I'm not speaking for anybody else. That was the point in my life when I lost everything that I began to grow. Because up to that point, I was doing what I thought I was supposed to be doing, working hard, putting in hours and all of these things. But that isn't what God had in mind for me. So I had to go through that crucible. And you want to, you want to talk about a crucible. That, that's a crucible. You know, you can lose your job, but you still might get an a unemployment check or something. But you lose a business, you've lost your livelihood. And... That was the case, and that's when I started understanding a few things in my life that I could not control. 
I could not control them, and I had to give it up to the Lord instead of me trying to figure it out and trying to make things a success. Daniel, verses 8 and 9, please. For she did not know that I gave her grain, new wine and oil, and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Therefore I will return and take away my grain in its time and my new wine in its season, and will take back my wool and my linen, given to cover her nakedness. Going to take it back. Taking back the, the, the new wine, the food. I mean, what does that mean then? What's going to happen to these people? Going to go into a famine, right? And, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do without in life. But you need water. And you need a little food. Rebecca. Verse 10, please. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall deliver her from my hand. Now did you catch that? No one shall deliver her from my hand. No one. That's pretty absolute. No one. Now, it goes on to say here that paragraph underneath raises two important issues about the way we experience God when he's bringing us to repentance. First, we risk not recognizing that God is at work. When Israel went through such hard and painful experiences, it might have been hard for them to recognize that their God was working for their salvation. That was hard for me to recognize in my situation. I mean, what is this? I've been paying my tithe. I've been paying offerings. I've been doing all these things. Going to church each week, doing things in church, had responsibilities. But yeah, can I understand that. When our path is blocked by sharp thorns or when we are walled in, so that we don't know where we are going. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but how many of wonder in this audience today have been in that situation where you're walled in and you don't know where you're going? Been there. <laughs> Couldn't find a job. Yep. Don't know what tomorrow holds. When our basic necessities disappear or we are embarrassed... Could our Father be in the middle of it all? He's already told us he's not going to forsake us, right? I mean, I've, I've read that many times before. He's not going to forsake us. Second, we risk misunderstanding God when he is at work. We may recognize that God is at work, but we don't like what he's doing. Hmm. Again, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but how many have been, I wonder, have been in that? We know he's working, but we don't like what he's doing. No, that's no fun. While we are feeling hurt and embarrassed, it is easy to blame God for being cruel, for not intervening, or for not caring. But God is always working to renew us through his covenant of love. Always working through us to renew it. His covenant of love. A couple of things here. Dennis has already shared one. Uh, at the bottom of page 35, Behold him grieved with your sins, and when you pray, repent, and earnestly desire to see him as your sin-pardoning redeemer, ready to bless you and to hear your acknowledgement of him. Keep close to his side. Keep close to his side. We need an abiding, heartfelt dependence upon the Son of God for salvation and for all wisdom and spiritual influences. Unless there is much more love to God and to man and a continual dependence upon the renewing, sanctifying grace of Christ to work a transformation of character by a divine change in the heart, which will be manifestly seen in word, spirit, and action, 
We shall fail in our work. You get that one? We shall fail in our work. Doesn't say we're going to get a C and be average or maybe get a D and pass. It says we shall fail in our work. We'll fail. It's not going to be successful. Not going to work. Page 41. Surviving through worship. Who are we talking about on Tuesday's lesson? Job. You know, my wife reminded me as we were studying this week, she says, you know, you think you have it bad or you've been through this and that and you've lost your job twice and you've lost a business and you've had crops that have failed and we have birds that are pestering us all the time and we go through drought and all these things. Well, that's true. She said, look what this guy went through. I mean, you know the story. You've studied it. You've read it. Can you imagine all these people, what was it, three or four, that came to him and said, well, you lost this, you lost that. You lost all your kids. They're gone. They're all dead. And then you have a companion who, your wife, She's a real encouragement. But can you imagine? You ever stop and think what she must have gone through mentally? I mean, we always focus on Joe, but what about his wife? Yeah, she's, she gets, she's infamous for the quote, you know, that it's in the scripture there. Just curse God. Be done with it. But I mean, you know, she was, had to feel pain, sorrow, losing everything. And you notice here's the question. It tells you to read Job 1, 6, all the way through chapter 2, verse 10. And it says, what caused Job's suffering? What caused it? Satan caused it. Satan caused it. Now, did you ever wonder, you know, he came before God. Notice that up there in heaven. He had access at that point. He came before God. And when he came before God, along with some other uh, sons of of God, he said, what have you been up to? And Satan's response was what? Going to and fro on on the earth. All over the place. And, you know, he continued on and of course, then what happened to, to Job? You know, Satan told him what? He told God what? What does Satan tell God? He only serves you because of what you do for him. Think about that a little bit. He only serves you because of what you do for him. Phil? I... I... I am conflicted with this story many times, but before Satan said that, didn't God say something to Satan? What did he say? Didn't he say, have you seen my servant Job? Job, yeah. Yeah, he was, he was waving the flag of, and I, I, I don't want to sound irreverent here, but arrogance. He was saying, I've got a trophy here. I've got a really saintly man here. Mm-hmm. Doggone it, why can't we just leave it be? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, we, we talk about what Satan did to Job. Would Satan have done this to Job if God hadn't have said, look at my saintly trophy that I have here? Can't answer that question. I will refer back to what you just referred to, verse 8. 
Let's go. Verse 8 says, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. Well, that's shuns evil. Mm -hmm. Peter. So when we think about things that happen to us in terms of, of, our, of our perspective, mm -hmm. it seems very unfair. But then when we take a step back, and we look at the perspective of the great controversy, mm -hmm. and we, we think about the accusation Satan has made against God, that your law is not fair, and by the way, nobody can keep it. And so God is, is showcasing not just to Satan, but to the whole universe. And he would never have said that if, Job, if, he, if Job's heart could not endure. I mean, we have to understand that because the Bible says there's no temptation taken to us, but such is common to man. But he is faithful and just not to lead us into any temptation that is more than we could bear. So he right. knows Job. Right. And Job knows him. Mm -hmm. And he is, he is testifying to the whole universe about his character that, that his law, not only is it just and righteous and holy, and by the way, the only way to live in any universe or any world and be happy, but there are people who have been tainted with sin who hate evil as much as I do. And I want to, I want to demonstrate not just to you, Satan, I want to demonstrate to the whole universe how my grace and power has worked in the heart of this man. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, it goes on here in verse 10. It says, Have you not made a hedge around him around his household, and around all that he has on every side. You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. It goes on to say, but now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. So the Lord said, okay, you can do what? You can take away everything except, yeah, can't kill him. And so, the story goes on, as I've already given you a condensed version about his family, about his livestock, and it all happened, as I read it here, in just a little bit of time, a short time, one thing after another. Bam, bam, bam. And let me ask you this question. Was Satan done with this situation now after all these catastrophic events? What's he do? What's the Bible tell us? Does he go back to see God? He does. He goes back. And what is, his, what is his argument now? Yeah. So, as it tells you here, and you read in the scriptures, it tells you, it says, chapter 2, again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. You ever think about that one? I can't explain it all, but I mean, just think about it a little bit. I mean, here's the guy that had been rebellious to you. He had taken one-third of the angels with him when he went, which we have no idea how many that is. It may be trillions. We don't know. But now he's coming to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Now, that's the second time, you know, he said to him that the first time. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job that there's none like him on the earth, a blameless, upright man, one who fears God, shuns evil? And still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited... Get that part. I'm, I'm reading from the new revised version here. You incited me against him to destroy him without cause. It 
goes on. So Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, as you just said, one, yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, he's in your hand, but you can't kill him. I always thought about that. But you can't kill him. You know the rest of that story. You imagine boils all over your body and scraping them. I've had one boil in my life, and that was one boil too many. But imagine all over your body and the stench, the smell from the pus and all of that. Well, you know, when you look at that, as I said, notice at the bottom, it says, Naked I come from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. Job acknowledges that God is still in total control. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. And third, Job concludes by reasserting his belief in the righteousness of God. May the name of the Lord be praised. May the name of the Lord be praised even with all of that stuff that's happening to his body. Peter? You know, the, uh, it's natural for us because our lives have a beginning and an end. At yeah. least that's what we know. Yep. By faith, we know there's no end. Right. And so we, we think that whatever happens to us in this short time that we have now is everything. And we forget it's but a blink of an eye for eternity, for the life that we'll have after this world. And so sometimes we forget that perspective too when we're talking about this. Um, I do want to say though, when, when we look at this story, we really see the power of God over Satan. Mm -hmm. Satan could not touch Job, but as soon as the hedge, as soon as God's presence was withdrawn and Satan was allowed to do whatever he wanted, we see what happens. And so, you know, for us, we just have to be, have comfort in the fact that at, at, there's nothing Satan can do without God's permission. Permission, right? <laughs> and so, you know, right. ultimately God is the one who's who's running the show, which is an awesome when we serve Him. It's an awesome thought. Now, sometimes that's painful. You know, I sat down. My wife said, "Well, it still sucks <laughs> yeah. when you go through those moments." Yeah, that's an yeah. exact quote. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> giving her a hard yeah. time. But that's true. But when, like I said, when we forget God is ultimately in control and when we forget that this, this life isn't what we're all about. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Sometimes mm -hmm. we are so narcissistic about the here and now mm -hmm. and we forget eternity mm -hmm. and that there's just such a bigger picture than my momentary. And it's, it's easy to say when you're not suffering, but there is a bigger picture than my momentary discomfort and my momentary uh, you know, issue that I'm right, facing. Right. Life is like a vapor. You know, like a vapor. Yes, Rebecca. My brother is a missionary in Cambodia currently with Adventist Frontier Missions. And um, he does all kinds of crazy stuff that I can't imagine uh, putting himself in situations I would never think of putting myself in or, or his kids. Um, just recently, somebody that was kind of coming into the church, I guess, had some family members that were murdered. And he went out and slept outside in this field right next to this house where the murder had happened with this person all night long. <laughs> and I can't imagine that. But um, anyway, in relationship to this um, rough times that we're talking about, um, I don't know how many of you know or don't know, but something that we're currently going through um, in moving up here. Our family was fragmented a little bit. A couple of our boys um, elected to go with their biological mom who is non-Christian, and that's where they are right now. And um, a lot of people have talked to us and said, you know, that's really sad, let's pray, let, let me pray with you, which is nice. But my brother is the only one um, when we talked to him, he said, let me pray with you. 
I want to praise God for what he's going to do in this situation. And let's praise him in advance. And when I'm looking at, you know, what the lesson is saying about Job and about how he had to learn to praise God in that situation, Mm -hmm. I feel like um, my brother's not perfect, but he's a great example in this circumstance of what God is asking us to do. Because if we truly believe, like Peter said, that God is totally in control, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then we can praise him in advance Mm -hmm. if Mm -hmm. we really have that trust. Very well said. Very, very good testimony. Yeah, if we have that trust and that confidence, yeah, praise him in advance before it it happens or whatever takes place. Yeah. Well, the um, we're over here on page uh, forty-two, surviving through hope, surviving through hope, and you know, folks. We sing about it. We used to sing this song, We Have This Hope. And when you think about where we are today, if we do not have hope, what do we have? Nothing. We have nothing. And you see, in the world today, that's why you see a lot of things going on and happening the way they are, because people don't have hope. This world right now, today, where they are, this is it. They're 60, 70, 80 years on this planet. That's it. So when you are dealing with somebody with that mentality, it's a completely different mentality than what we possess. We possess a mentality that there is hope, that there is another uh, reward coming, another day coming of salvation and redemption. But many people, no, they don't have that. And you'll notice here, Paul, it talks about that. And it says down here, it says, Paul continues to set his eyes on proclaiming the gospel. He knows that God will rescue him in the future. And it says, first, God's proven track record. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. Second, Paul's determination to fix his concentration on God himself. On him, we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. And third, the saints' continual intercession as you help us by your prayers. As you help us by your prayers. You know, when you think about things today and surviving in this old world and the prayers that we send up, And, you know, the last part of the lesson was about extreme heat going to Isaiah there. And you you think about these things in our lives today. Yes, we all have crucibles. We're going through them. Uh, But again, as I'm reminded, no one has tarred and feathered me lately. No one is throwing rocks at me. No one is doing these things and threatening me to hang me or anything like that. So as you go through these things, you you take a look at life a little differently and realize that all of our hope should be in Jesus Christ. All of our faith should be in Jesus Christ and not in ourselves, but in Jesus Christ each and every day so that we can know that voice when it comes to us, so we can understand and know when Jesus is talking to us. These are the things that are so important in going through that extreme heat because, folks, I'm going to tell you firsthand, if we do not have that connection, that extreme heat will hurt. It will hurt. And it may hurt to the point of wondering what God is doing to us and maybe even to the point of driving ourselves, it's ourselves, our choice, away from God. 